This is CBC Here and Now. We started the month off above seasonal and we're going to end it below seasonal. That small sprinkle of snow on the ground in Cornerbrook this morning had a lot of people thinking about their annual winter carnival. But because of COVID, that whole event is cancelled this year. I was really disappointed to tell you the truth. Uh, everybody felt that this is something that we have to really sit down and think about. I'll explain what's going on. Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. We begin tonight with another potential shot in the arm for the province's struggling offshore oil industry. Two new discoveries have been confirmed, hundreds of kilometers off St. John's in waters 10 times deeper than the Hibernia oil field. As Here and Now's Terry Roberts reports, the news is generating optimism among those hoping for the industry's recovery. Those working on this rig likely have mixed emotions. Their jobs on the Transocean Barrens are just about done, and future work is scarce. But in the world of oil exploration, they did what they set out to do. At a time when oil companies are slashing exploration budgets, this rig was striking oil, not once, but twice, in prospects known as Kappa Hayden and Cabriol. This is, uh, again, great news at a time when the uh, industry itself is looking uh, for, for great news. The man leading this province's oil and gas corporation is walking with a little extra lift in his step today. It is indeed encouraging. The prospects there are uh, substantive or else, of course, they wouldn't be, be drilled. The discoveries were made in areas licensed to Equinor and BP Canada. Just how much oil? The company say it's too early to give details or to speculate on what it might mean for that area of deep water called the Flemish Pass Basin. Meanwhile, the finds are not far from earlier significant discoveries at Bay de Nord, where Equinor is teamed up with Husky Energy. The Bay de Nord project was deferred in March because of the pandemic and depressed oil prices. But these new discoveries could improve the business case for the province's first ever deep water oil field. Hopefully, we'll see some more activity on the Equinor Beta Nord project as a result of these two wells. This veteran oil consultant says there are still big hurdles to overcome. Things like distance, water depths of 1,000 meters, and volatile oil prices. Some leading consultants in the world say you need $50 a barrel prices to justify deep water development, and I would suggest that they probably need more than $50 a barrel. As for Jim Keating, he predicts oil prices will recover soon and exploration will pick up. I'm actually hoping for 2022 to be, um, um, not next summer, but the summer after, the return to that bow wave mentality. Because what this shows with these two wells, which are likely the last of the wells that were planned pre-COVID, is that there is a significant opportunity for Newfoundland and Labrador in our prospectivity. As for this rig, it will sail for Norway next week, taking nearly 300 jobs and possibly opening the door to another producing oil field. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. And as the province's oil industry continues to struggle with low prices and deferred projects, the Premier is describing today's news as positive. The announcement comes the day before Andrew Fury and his energy minister meet with officials from Synovus, the company merging with Husky Energy. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Exciting. Equinor isn't releasing details about its new finds, but the Premier believes they are significant. Anytime there's a find that people are announcing, it's a significant one, I would think, I would hope. Fury expects today's announcement will ultimately accelerate the company's Deepwater Bay de Nord project, which was deferred in March. And uh, anytime that, uh, you know, you have a significant find on top of other finds, that changes the economic needle, one would think of any uh, structure for uh, future uh, developments. Fury and the energy minister are scheduled to meet with Synovus for the first time since its merger with Husky was announced. To me, it's a case of trying to ascertain what, you know, what's their aspirations to, uh, to this merger? How do we fit into their big picture? Uh, with Husky, we've been basically looking at, you know, we have a scope of work that's been put to us. Let's try to do what we can uh, for 2021 to put people back to work and, and, and again, to further the project for 2022. The progressive conservative leader says he knows what he'd be looking for if he were meeting with Synovus, a promise that the mothballed West White Rose project will go ahead. 
reassurance from the CEO of the new organization that now owns the Husky assets, what the future holds for them. And in fact, do they even want to keep these assets? Because I think that question is up in the air. Equinor previously announced that it will be moving its Alberta offices to Newfoundland and Labrador, but it hasn't said when that will happen or how many people will be coming. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Fuel prices are spiking across the island after North Atlantic refining pleaded with the PUB for an increase. The company says the cost of importing fuel has gone up and argued fuel prices should reflect that. North Atlantic refining owns the idled come by chance refinery. The company placed it in standby mode in late March because of the global pandemic and the resulting collapse in oil prices. North Atlantic says it's been importing refined fuels into the province for the past six months, driving up expenses. But the company says the PUB's markups don't take that into account. It's based on having an operating refinery. After a review, the board approved a four cent increase for gas and a three cent increase for diesel in Newfoundland. In Labrador, gas prices will drop by about a cent and a half. <laughs> a chilly start to the day for most of us uh, below zero minus one in St. John's minus four in Gander. In fact, that is the coldest overnight low uh, in the last 20 years. Actually, in October last time it was Halloween, uh, the last time that that happened. So we did see plenty of uh, cool temperatures. However, the temperatures did kind of recover this afternoon. Five degrees in St. John's six in Corner Brook, but those temperatures staying below zero up through uh, most of Labrador. Minus four was the afternoon high in Lab City. So we did see uh, plenty of cloud cover today. Some peaks of sun as well with the uh, showers and or flurries moving through for uh, the majority. And good thing uh, I noticed this afternoon is the radar is finally showing up on my system. So that's nice to see. Uh, this is cloud cover ahead of what is now post tropical storm Zeta all the way uh, back in the States. That's not really going to affect us as we head through the couple of days, but these cool temperatures are going to stick around. I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, we haven't hit Halloween just yet, but many town councils and communities already have their eyes on Christmas and beyond. What would have been the 50th Corner Brook Winter Carnival has been canceled. Instead, the golden anniversary will be pushed to a post-pandemic date down the road. Here and now's Colleen Connors has more. Right here in Margaret Bowater Park is usually where the Winter Carnival gets started with a huge party and a large opening ceremony. But for the first time in 49 years, the Cornerbrook Winter Carnival is canceled because of the pandemic. And that has a lot of people upset. Well, we had this not, not in our gut, I guess, that I said, oh gee whiz, we were planning so much and we wanted this to go ahead. I was really disappointed to tell you the truth. Cummings was the 2020 Youth Ambassador for Winter Carnival, something she will never forget. It was so beautiful. I got to make so many connections with people and do a lot of fun activities. And I think that doing activities with people that you come to love and care for was definitely the best part. Carnival has been an annual tradition since the 70s that focuses on family fun day in the park, musical concerts, big meals at the Legion, and it all runs for about two weeks. Dave Elms, carnival mascot Leaf the Lucky, has been involved for decades. We, we looked at all of the circumstances in relation to how carnival works and we just said, it's, it's not gonna be possible to do it and to be safe. And I think that was the big word that we were using all the time. We wanna be safe with people. It would have been impossible to safely distance during the events, outside or inside, but he's encouraging the public to still celebrate from home. What we're asking them to do is keep the flame burning in their own way and keep the spirit alive. So uh, keep your Christmas lights on as we normally do during Carnival. Decorate your windows with Carnival scenes. Build snow sculptures or snow creations in your yard and, and things like that. So uh, maybe in that vein that maybe we can hopefully keep the spirit going until we actually get to the 50th. Elms, Cummings and the Carnival Committee are already working on big plans for the 50th celebration, just not this winter. Elm says there's no need to fret because any big event like the family fun day in the park here will just be put on pause. 
So all of the 50th annual celebrations will just take place in 2022. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. Well, another annual tradition won't be the same this year. Public health guidelines don't allow for the traditional Santa Claus parade due to COVID. Organizers across the province are in scramble mode, trying to figure out how to celebrate safely. Here now, Cease Hare has more. Every year it goes off without a hitch, but this year one thing is for certain. The annual Santa Claus parade in St. John's won't look like this. Without marching bands, cheerleaders or dancers, it's hard to say just how parades will look this year in this province due to the pandemic. Nobody wants to, to not have some kind of a parade, but right now we don't know what we're going to do. We're looking to others and they're looking to us. One idea bouncing around is what's referred to as a reverse parade, where spectators, instead of watching floats go by, drive by parked floats on Harbour Drive. Hanlon says it sounds simple enough, but it is problematic. Traffic, safety issues, accessibility and controlling crowds. And another thing could be that, you know, uh, uh, people would probably congregate anyway. If you've got a large uh, a gathering, if you've got a large float uh, selection here, people are going to walk down here and have a look at that. And as I said before, we, at the pedestrian mall, you know, we had an incident there that caused a lot of stress for a lot of people. And the last thing we want to do is to have some kind of event that would hurt people. Obviously, you would have to make sure that people who are on the floats together and uh, that the floats are spaced so that, you know, bubbles aren't mixing and things like that. But, um, you know, anything that will cut down on the, on, on the crowd gathering and, and certainly there would have to be some crowd controls at the beginnings and ends and, and that sort of thing. And St. John's isn't alone in this quagmire. CBS is reviewing the results of a recent online survey and plans to make an announcement early next week. Discussions around a parade are still underway in Mount Pearl. Portugal Cove St. Philip say nothing is confirmed, but a Christmas plan is in the works. And volunteers in Grand Falls, Windsor say they have a plan which needs town approval. There's a lot of uncertainty now over the status of the parade in St. John's, but one thing is for certain, this year it will be different. Cease here, CBC News, downtown St. John's. Well, are you getting the flu shot this year? Tens of thousands of people already have, and many more are signed up. But the health minister is not ready to declare this year's flu season a success. Here announced Peter Cowan joins us live. So, Peter, let's start with the numbers. How many people have had the shot so far? Yeah, Carolyn, government has put a big push on because normally less than a third of people in this province get a flu shot. The good news, already almost 20% of people have either gotten the shot or signed up to get it. Let's take a look at some of those numbers. So pharmacists have already given out 28,000 flu shots. So this is the first year that they've been free to receive from pharmacies. Another 52,000 people have either received or signed up to get a flu shot from the public health clinics. That's not bad considering clinics like this one here in St. John's only opened up a week ago. The big concern this winter is that the province will end up dealing with a double whammy, a spike in COVID cases at the same time they're seeing a spike in influenza and that could overwhelm the hospitals. The health minister though isn't relaxing. He's going to keep the push on to make sure more people get their flu shots. We need to keep the population as healthy as possible uh, with an older group, the double whammy of flu and then COVID. Uh, or the two simultaneously uh, would be a real challenge medically for them. Uh, and I think it would be a significant challenge for the healthcare system should we have uh, a serious spike in both at around the same time. So um, cautiously optimistic, but not sitting on my hands being complacent. Now, they are also going to go into schools in order to administer flu shots, but only students in grades four and above are going to get it. Now, the flu shot is safe for younger students. The problem, though, is a practical one. They normally need a little bit of help from their parents, and right now, parents aren't being allowed into the schools. I can speak from mounds of experience as a family doctor. It is a little bit more difficult to give uh, an injection to those uh, children and uh, because they tend to get upset and they need to be held and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, it would be, uh, I think, very difficult for one 
uh, one uh, nurse to be able to, uh, to do that uh, without having the parents come in. Now, is there going to be enough vaccine for all these people that are getting the flu shot? The health minister says yes. They already have 200,000 doses of the vaccine, and they're expecting another shipment to come before Christmas. Carolyn? Thanks so much, Peter. That's here now. It's Peter Cowan reporting live. Well, money is running out for the food helpline service added to 811 in the early days of the pandemic. It was set up to get people resources. So if a food bank couldn't help the caller, operators had resources like hampers and gift cards they could give out. They also help people without MCP coverage and those with severe dietary restrictions. Now 811 is referring callers elsewhere instead of providing food. But there could be more money coming. Earlier this month, Ottawa announced another $100 million in pandemic aid for food banks. Some of that could end up in this province, but how much and when has yet to be decided. Well, political moves are being made. Some notable local names are throwing their hat into the ring, announcing nomination bids for the upcoming provincial and federal elections. After some recent speculation, Joanne Thompson, the executive director of The Gathering Place, has confirmed she's seeking the federal liberal nomination in St. John's East and... Hi, I'm Chris Andrews. After MHA Ken Parsons announcement today that he won't be seeking re-election in the riding of Cape St. Francis, I would like to officially announce that I will be seeking the nomination for the PC party in the riding of Cape St. Francis, Newfoundland and Labrador. Yes, Shani Ganuck's front man is seeking the PC nomination. As Andrews said, MHA Kevin Parsons is not seeking re-election. Parsons spoke to reporters today about that decision. It's just the timing is, is good for me now. Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm at a stage in my life right now where I'm still be up there in the, in the 60s, so I decided that I wouldn't take another run and uh, spend a little bit more time with family. I got nothing planned in the future, but whatever comes, I'm not saying it's going to be, I'm a very active person, and I know that I'll stay at something, but what it is, maybe cutting wood, maybe doing a bit of fishing, I enjoy everything. Now, Parsons says that seat has been held by the PCs since Confederation, and he hopes it stays that way. He doesn't plan to endorse any nominees, instead saying he'll wait until an official candidate is selected. Well, Fong's Restaurant and Motel, a staple of birthday dinners, weddings, and even politician banquets in Carbonier, has closed its doors after over 60 years in business. The business expanded to offer motel units in the 1980s. It became a place for movers and shakers to be seen in Conception Bay North. Owner Art Fong says the closure is a direct result of financial strain from COVID-19. Public health restrictions around event bookings and reduced occupancy in the restaurant cut business dramatically. Here's some of Fong speaking to CBC over the years. Fong's has changed locations, but it's been around since 1955. Actually, a lot busier than I thought we were going to be. Okay. Fong took the restaurant over from his father. He's a man of few words that say a lot. What's this town meant to you and your family? A living. We, we left the old country f for freedom. And I'm the third generation. Everybody got to work hard in Newfoundland. You want to make you got to work hard. Well, keeping with Carbonier, it's time for our final ghost story in Here and Now's spooky series, The Haunting Of. Four years ago, a couple bought a house in the Conception Bay North Town site unseen. It wasn't until they moved in that they discovered the home's troubled past with ties to death and murder, and they started to experience strange things. We bought the house in Carbonier about uh, four years ago now. We were uh, living in Australia and we wanted to move back to Newfoundland. And we came across this house that had been on the market for a while. We bought it right away even without seeing it uh, in person. We came back, there was kind of an immediate unease about the house. It's a, it's a house in the center of downtown Carbonier, but somehow 
as a house on top of a hill in the middle of a field, it feels so isolated. And it's that gigantic, very, very creepy, massive tree on the front of the yard that blocked the view of the whole house from the city. There's been a number of instances that are a bit weird <laughs> and definitely made us question our sanity at times. We've had been in the shed every day nearly um, for the whole year we're living in the house uh, because you know we're doing, using a storage and for renovation. Now the shed's locked, so I knew that it was only myself and Chris who had access to it. And right in the middle of the floor in the attic was this piece of paper. So we took the piece of paper and it had this poem on it. But at the end of, uh, of this note, was uh, two lines that had been added and it said uh, beneath your invisible tree uh, there lay a gift for you uh, and so which kind of both give chills up our spine there was just no reason for it to be in there we still have no idea how it got there one day myself and larry were outside building a fire and this is at night looking up at the house in the guest bedroom there was a white like object in the shape of a person that moved across the window in the completely dark pitch room. It reminded me of if Larry were in the window wearing his, um, he has a white uh, knitted, almost like captain's like sweater. All upstairs, the lights were off. We had two friends with us who were in the kitchen and I, I could see them in the kitchen on the other side, bottom corner of the house. No cars were going by. There was nothing nearby to add a light. And then the next morning, one of our friends who was coming out in the hallway, she heard someone walking down the stairs and she went to the stairwell and she saw Larry, who often wears a white sweater, and saw him turn around the corner. And then she also then heard him start to kind of be in the kitchen and start breakfast. And she went downstairs to go see him, and but he wasn't there. We don't usually sell our house as a haunted house to Airbnb guests, um, but one pair, um, so that they saw two, a pair of red eyes in the window in the guest bedroom uh, when they woke up in, in the middle of the night. And then there's another recent guest. Their things kept moving on them when they, so they leave the room and then they go back and it wasn't there, but then they go back again and it was back in its place. So um, without, yeah, without them even knowing any of the backstory of the property. For those who want to learn more about the haunted past or potentially the darker history of Carboneer, um, the best way to find out is to come and, and ask the locals yourself. It's their story to tell. And, and, and they definitely have no problem telling it. <laughs> when I got, I got chills when he said they got chills, so I did. I couldn't listen to that. Oh, I'm yeah, I so... wonder if there is anything in, under the ground, buried under the ground out there. Um, yeah, probably. <laughs> Are you okay? Did you make yeah, it through that okay? I'll be fine if I can get through the weather now. She's a bit see. of a scaredy cat. <laughs> oh, Halloween, I don't know. It's, I guess Halloween's not my favorite thing, suppose, but whatever. It's okay. <laughs> One thing that isn't looking scary is the Halloween forecast, which is good, although it is looking a little bit chilly. I'll have all those details and your full five day forecast when I come back.
Welcome back. Ashley's here now with a look at the weather forecast. Tomorrow's Friday. Yes. How are things looking as we're heading into this big Halloween weekend? It's looking like it's cold. I mean, we've started the uh, the month off talking about these record-breaking temperatures, and now we're talking about uh, well below seasonable temperatures. And uh, yeah, let's take a look at where we're sitting right now. Three degrees in St. John's, two in Badger, and similar temperature in Cornerbrook. And then we've got uh, Twillingate, oh, not showing a temperature there, probably around one degree and uh, six in St. Lawrence right now, and then minus six in Lab City. So not a whole lot going on weather-wise uh, as far as big systems are go. We have a, a low pressure system up through uh, affecting Labrador with some associated fronts with that. And then this is the cloud cover from uh, the leftover remnants of what is now tropical or post-tropical storm Zeta. So uh, just show you a little bit of the radar right now. The exciting thing is that it's starting to show up in my system here so I can see the showers that are happening across the province or at least in the eastern portions of the island uh, tonight. And you can see that that will generally continue as we head through the overnight tonight with some scattered showers changing over to the potential for some flurries as these temperatures drop overnight and then some periods of snow possible along the west coast, certainly in the higher elevations. You'll probably pick up a few centimeters by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. Then we've got that scattered flurry activity happening for coastal areas of Labrador as well. And then uh, in Lab West, it's pretty much just going to be the potential for flurries as we head through the overnight tonight. And then it'll generally start to clear out as we head towards the morning hours. So here's where we should be sitting overnight. The winds will ramp up uh, westerlies, uh, west or west northwesterlies, gusting anywhere from 40 to as much as 50 kilometers per hour. Exposed areas in the east could see gusts upwards of about 70 kilometers per hour as well. Uh, overall temperature Temperatures will be hovering near or just below zero through the majority of central and the west coast and then along the southern shore, uh, southern portions of the island rather. We're looking at about two degrees for Marystown, one in Port of Basque and then well below zero for Lab City. You're sitting at about minus nine tonight with uh, those gusty winds, so wind chill values much cooler than that. Now tomorrow, uh, once that area of low pressure moves off, we should actually see a mix of sun and cloud through the day with the potential for flurries in the first half of the morning, and then that should clear out. But again, those winds are going to stay quite brisk. Some coastal uh, flurries possible for Labrador as well as in the higher elevations, maybe a few flurries in the west as well. But overall, it'll be a fairly quiet night. However, we will see the potential for some flurries move right back in uh, as we head towards the evening and overnight hours uh, in that onshore flow along the, anywhere really along the northeast here in the metro area as well and then along the west coast as we see that onshore flow and some cooler temperatures as well. Oh, uh, daytime highs tomorrow, not overly impressive. Zero to uh, three degrees through the day. We should be sitting around nine degrees as a normal for this time of year. And then uh, with those winds gusty, northwesterlies or westerlies anywhere from 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. But again, you'll see the sun peak out at times, so it'll feel a little bit better. Uh, and then up through Labrador, gusty winds for you as well. 50 to as much as 60 kilometer per hour wind gusts expected and temperatures between zero and minus six. So as we head into Saturday, we're going to see the potential for some flurries or showers through the majority of the day. Plenty of cloud cover as well. And then up through Labrador, same thing. Some periods of snow possible uh, through the afternoon. Then things will start to clear as we get into the evening hours. However, along the West Coast, you'll probably see that potential for some flurries sticking around in those onshore winds. An area of high pressure will skirt south of us on Sunday, which means uh, things will probably be a mix of sun and cloud through the day. Maybe a few cloudy periods and then a low pressure system is going to move in Sunday afternoon bringing in the potential for some snow for Lab West and areas to the north as well. Temperatures are going to stay chilly. Uh, we won't really see a warm up at least until next week. So two degrees in St. John's as the afternoon high uh, on Saturday and then again that potential for flurry. Some sunshine in the mix as well. Uh, minus two for Happy Valley Goose Bay, minus six in Lab City and if we take a look at the forecast, this is around 6 p.m. for when we're uh, we're going to head out <laughs> to do some trick or treating. About two degrees will be the uh, temperature in the metro area. Chance of flurries, maybe some showers as well. But note these winds. So these, even though these temperatures are going to be quite cold, the wind chills are going to feel more like minus five, more than likely in the metro area uh, towards central as well. That chance of flurries sticking around the west. Happy Valley Goose Bay looks lovely, but chilly, minus three. And then Lab City, you're looking at flurries and uh, a temperature near minus eight. So will be cold into Sunday. We're going to rebound a little bit 
as far as temperatures go. So back into the mid to high single digits. And then Monday, it's looking like is when we're going to see a warm up. So a big push of warm air, relatively speaking, 12 degrees with some rain moving in, looking like we're going to see some windy conditions as well. That's the story pretty much across the province. And then a dip down as we head into Tuesday. So back down into those uh, well below seasonable temperatures. Eastern Labrador, you're looking at about nine degrees. So push a warm air for you as well. However, it doesn't look like it'll make its way towards Lab West. You're so going to be still be sitting around one degree and then minus nine for Tuesday. I wanted to share this lovely shot, an evening at the beach, the Manuals River walking trail there. Thank you so much to Karen for sharing that with us. And if you have any weather photos, share with us on to nlphotos at cbc.ca. I do remember other Filipino families living here, and that's that's who I grew up with with work, other other kids around my age that, that later moved to the mainland, moved more west to the bigger Filipino communities. Just ahead, it's the first episode of NL in Color.
Welcome back. Well, tonight we're bringing you the first episode in our new series, NL in Color. It's a series about race identity in Newfoundland and Labrador, and it's presented by St. John's morning show host, Ram Raj Shavendran. These will be longer stories, full experiences from people of color, their firsthand accounts of living in this province and finding their place. Richie Perez remembers being bullied mercilessly for his skin color, but still he calls Newfoundland home. Here's his story. There's something under your chair. Oh no, what is it? This is, you want me to show it to you? Sure. There you go. Huh. That's me. <laughs> Tell me about Richie on the tire swing. Uh, this is probably me at like four or five, I guess. I think it was shot in Toronto. We did a uh, family uh, drive across Canada when we were young. The late 70s or early 80s, I think. My parents decided to drive across and see what Canada was years, uh, like a few years after we've, we've moved to, to Canada from the Philippines. What was it like growing up here um, as a young Filipino kid in, in Newfoundland? It was, uh, like, I, I was fairly young to kind of remember, but I have flashbacks of, like, memories of growing up. I, I do remember other Filipino families living here, and that's, that's who I grew up with, with were other, other kids around my age that, that later moved to the mainland, moved more west to the bigger Filipino communities, uh, where it was a bit more diverse, and my family decided to stay here. It was hard for a lot of minorities to find work here as well, and that's why a lot of people left to go west. And like my sister, for example, my sister had an English degree. She finished Memorial. I didn't. Um, she ended up having to move to Calgary to find work. And this was in the early, early 90s. You don't normally see people working here uh, with, with profession, you know, like with careers. And I was lucky to be one of the people that managed to stay. Did you feel like you were a part of the community that you lived in? Uh, like after some of these friends that you grew up with that were Filipino, you know, moved back to the mainland, or moved to the mainland rather, did you feel like you were a part of this province, a part of the city? As a kid, I, I, I wasn't thinking, like I wasn't sure of that, but I, I did end up getting along and becoming friends with, with local Newfoundlander kids that, uh, that accepted me. Like, you know, I, I, when I do remember experiences of like when we first met that they didn't understand like the color of my skin or where I was from, uh, who I was. What did that look like when they didn't understand it? Like um, I look back at it now and I feel it was kind of like an, kind of an uneducated ignorance kind of thing, you know, but I became friends with a lot of, a lot of the friends that, that didn't understand. And I guess like from them welcome, like us hanging out and them coming over to my parents' house, they've kind of like learned. We would have fried rice for breakfast, the like, different foods that my friends would, would be eating. And they'd be overwhelmed and, and surprised of what we were eating. And, and I'd be going over uh, across the street to my friend Randy's house and I'd be excited eating like mac and cheese and, <laughs> and fish and brews. When you say that they were overwhelmed with the food, what was their reaction? Well, uh, they're, you know, just like, oh, what's that? What's that smell? I've never smelled that before. <laughs> and it was probably my parents cooking shrimp and, and fish. You know, like, we, we ate a lot of fish as, as well, uh, like dried fish and stuff. I don't know if, if you know dried fish when you yeah. fry it. It's a lot more stronger than... It's than pungent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of years, you know, you're in your teens and whatnot. Who was Richie at that time? How would you describe him? High school for me was kind of, uh, was, there were times there were difficult times. There was a lot of racism going on or just uneducated assumptions and stuff like that. And my sister and I, we didn't grow up the same as many of uh, the Filipino friends because we were influenced by a lot of like, uh, like, like punk music. Skateboarding was a big part of me around here in the 80s. And, um, and with, with that being a little different it, through, through school and high school, it was, it, there was a lot of, on, on top of me being a person of color, it was, it was, it, there was a, some sort of kind of like bullying, like in my early junior high school days, there was bullying on the go, like I was being chased. And, and in the high school, it was kind of more of the, like, like um, 
hidden kind of, like, you, you sensed that, you know, that no, no one would hang out with me. I had four skateboarder friends and, and few, few core friends that, that accepted, like that were, that were really good friends, but yeah. Like, what did that racism look like? There was probably like two or two, two, two to f five uh, kids that were going to this school that were, uh, were minorities that, uh, and, and from what I remember, we, like, we, we got picked on a lot. Chased, uh, picked on fights, names. One specifically, like someone asked, one of the kids I, that I do remember, I'd never forget it, they asked me if I, it, what, do, what language do I speak? Do I speak French? So I, I, I don't know, like, it, it's probably just, just like uneducated, uh, like ignorance, I guess, that uh, they, they didn't understand. And I went through a lot of that and uh, a, a lot of this, and, and maybe it led to me being more in denial of my, my culture. So I grew up kind of like, kind of backing away from that and trying to be more in the Western cult. To like, fit in. To fit in, exactly, yeah. NL In Color will be back after this commercial break.
Welcome back. We're continuing now with part two of NL in Color, our series airing every other Thursday on here and now. We heard Richie Perez tell us about growing up on the island, what that was like for him, how he grew up in denial of his culture and tried to assimilate. Now we'll hear about what he did to try to undo some of that assimilation and relearn his culture. So you said you didn't notice it, but when did you start noticing that you had done that, that you were, you know, assimilating or adapting to your I'm in my 40s now, and I think I'm, I'm realizing all of this because, uh, realizing this just like in the past years now, because uh, I'm, I'm older, I'm, I'm, I've, I've, I've become a bit more observant on, on myself. I, I, I traveled um, after uh, my divorce in 2016 or 20, 2015 or so, I decided to kind of rediscover my, my culture by leaving um, Canada and going to Philippines for about two months or so. I took my mother back there, she moved back, she worked here all her years, and, and I wanted to get away from what was going on here feeling rock bottom, and I, I went and traveled on my own. Just trying to relearn my uh, culture, trying to understand, meeting all my cousins and family back there and seeing things, so I look back at it and I felt like that I missed out on some of the culture that you know, I didn't go through while I was growing up here. What did that do to you? Like, what was that, what was going through your mind during that trip? It was kind of like in a, a very low time of my life because I, uh, I separated and, uh, and I went out there just to kind of get in, back into this kind of survival mode because I think I was very dependent on, 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 on things and like, you know, I, I completely let go, I guess. And I, uh, I, I went back and I just wanted to gain my my independence back, so I, I went on my own and discovered like seeing people out there struggling with hardship and realizing maybe one of the reasons why my family took us over here and wanting us to, to grow up in what we would call like a better environment or better a better life. So I started appreciating like what was out there, seeing people living on the streets and hardly any support and realized like my life here isn't as bad. So, and probably come to peace as well about the, the two cultures that I grew up with, with Filipino culture and, and Newfoundland culture. So I came, I came back trying to kind of immerse myself back into Filipino, Fil in the Filipino culture that, that uh, I miss because I my my mom isn't cooking for me anymore, so I um, I miss the food and I uh, I go I go to the Filipino uh, um, gatherings and and try to immerse myself with with them and try to understand the the, cult, uh, the the culture again. So when have you felt the most connected in this province? Because I think we've talked a little bit about some of the disconnections you've had, some of the experiences of racism, but have you felt? A point of connection here, like growing up, and when when did you feel it the most? I played guitar and I started uh, making music here locally, and I I was in a band, and uh, and we played throughout the, the early '90s, mid '90s, and I'm still playing once in a while. But um, the music scene, the alternative music scene, got really really big uh, in the early '90s here. Um, many bands were, were 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 getting signed and getting making albums and and I think a lot of the people in the alternative music scene took me under their wing and I felt playing in front at the LSB Hall, playing at all these different bars, um, I felt accepted when when I heard heard those cheers for the first time uh, because like it's here here's me minority me and and there weren't many people at the time and, and many minorities um, playing playing alternative music there were a few but. It was it was very rare, and uh, that that kind of um, uh, brought up my confidence and feeling like I was part of something. And uh, how old were you? And when was that first moment that you started feeling that? I was probably around uh, like 17 or 18, like around after high school. After high school, I I, I, I think I found my my friends, my, the, my band members. I was in a band called Potato Bug. <laughs> Like, it, there was no sense of like, like, oh, you're, you're different or whatever. What are you doing in the music scene? Do you get this? Do you get asked where are you from? I, I still do, yeah. When people ask me that, I say I'm a, I'm a Filipino, Newfoundlander, Canadian. It's the only way I can explain it. I, I can't go too deep because I, 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 I'm just not the, the, 
the person to, to kind of explain. Like, I, I don't want to make it trivial or, or, or difficult, but that, that's what I say. I say, like, you know, I grew up here. I became Canadian citizen in 1981 or 1980, so I'm Canadian. I was born in the Philippines, and I grew up here, and I, and I have a bit of little, the accent or, <laughs> you know, the, of, of, of being a Newfoundlander. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, can, I, can, I can talk Newfoundland, Newfoundlandese if it, or, or if, if, uh, if I go a little fast with, uh, okay. with speaking, so. If you were meeting a young Richie, so it doesn't have to be you specifically, but what would you want to tell them? What would you want to warn them about or, you know, advise them? Or what would you want them to know about growing up here? I, w I would say, like, you know, make, make as much friends as you can. Like, I, I, re I, f I felt, like, for my experience, uh, um, making friends it, it does feel like you're part of part of community, part of something, part of a group. What, one of the big things that I do, do regret is I've missed out a lot of my Filipino culture. I, could, I wish I could have went back to the Philippines more and, and, and visited my family and, and kept up to date with what this and that, like, you know, with uh, what, what, what's happening out there and, and, and that. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. No, that's great. Okay. When Ram showed me this frame, or this picture, I was like, did, did my mom send you this? <laughs> because this, this frame is like, that was like one of the, part of the frames that I, uh, that I seen at my house growing up in like, on, on Escopi Crescent or so. I was like, wow. But yeah, that's me. And look, I probably have like some soup, soup stain on my t-shirt. So, <laughs> all right.
Another gruesome attack has left three people dead in France. This is the moment police stormed the Notre Dame Basilica in Nice, shooting a knife-wielding man inside. He'd been shouting, Allah Akbar. An elderly parishioner was beheaded and two other people killed, including the church warden. The suspect, reportedly a 21-year-old Tunisian man, survived and was taken to hospital. French President Emmanuel Macron visited the scene and called the incident a terrorist attack. He raised the country's alert level to maximum and vowed to send out thousands of soldiers to protect the country's churches and schools. This is the third attack in France in the last two months. Just two weeks ago, a teacher was beheaded. He had shown his students a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau condemned the attacks in France. Speaking at an international conference, he called them heinous, unjustifiable, and an affront to all our values. The criminals, the terrorists, the cold-blooded murderers who perpetrated these attacks do not represent Islam. They do not get to define Muslims in Canada, in France, or anywhere around the world. Well, CBC News has learned the president of UPS was granted a ministerial exemption by the foreign affairs minister and was allowed to skip mandatory quarantine laws after entering Canada. Nando Cesarone was in Toronto last week for three days of business meetings to present a new contract to UPS workers. Their union says allowing him to skip quarantine put delivery drivers who are essential frontline workers at risk. NDP MP Jack Harris who represents St. John's East, is questioning why the federal government would issue such an exemption. I don't see the necessity to have some special exemption like this. After all, even, with, even within Canada, you know, we have, I can't go to Ottawa and, 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 and come back to St. John's, Newfoundland without a 14-day exemption. We have workers from Newfoundland doing the same thing, coming back uh, to work uh, and having to have a 14-day uh, quarantine here. This idea of uh, s s behind closed doors, non-transparent ministerial exemptions where you have to dig around to find out why it's happening, that's not fair to, to Canadians, and I don't think Canadians would accept that it's fair and reasonable. Now, the company says the UPS executive followed all health and safety protocols. This is the third such case of business executives being granted quarantine exemptions reported as part of an ongoing CBC News investigation. You can read more about it on our website, cbcnews.ca. All right, time now for a quick weather recap. Yeah, let's talk about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Looking like it's going to be a lovely day. We should see, uh, as far as sunshine goes, a few flurries in the first half of the day. And then those winds, though, are going to be quite brisk. 20 uh, to as much as 50 kilometers per hour across the board. And temperatures cold into the 1 to 3 degree range. As we head into Saturday, same thing. We're going to see a few flurry potentials as well as some sunshine peeking through. But again, these cold temperatures are going to stick around. Yep, trick-or-treater is going to keep an eye on that forecast for sure tomorrow. You're, you're going to need some room for your warm jacket underneath it, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone. Good, Good night. night. Good night.